So to recap where we got, we started with the retina, um, 100 million photoreceptors, lots of processing in those three layers right within the retina. The output of the retina is the retinal ganglion cells. A million of those send their inputs up the optic track um, to the LGN, and those cells already have picked out changes in time and space. They like spots of a certain size that change in brightness over time. Okay? They then go to the LGN right there in the middle. They make a single synapse in the LGN, and then they project up to primary visual cortex up here, where we see um, a retinotopic map. We see orientation selectivity. We saw how that was computed from retinal ganglion cell type receptive fields. And we see these ocular dominance columns. Okay, so these are the major first few stages of the visual system. Everybody on board here? I know this is a lot of details. Um, but what's cool about this is we can see how information is kind of getting processed differentially at different stages. We can start to see the buildup of a whole series of computations. Okay, so now we've landed up in the cortex, finally. What next? Well, what next is that um, all hell breaks loose. You've probably seen this diagram before. It's pretty, pretty horrifying. This is visual cortex. It is complicated as hell. Um, this is a very old diagram from 1991 from studies of monkeys. It's gotten much more complicated since then. Once you get up to visual cortex, there's a bunch of properties. First of all, there are dozens of distinct patches of cortex, distinct areas of cortex that process different kinds of visual information. Okay? Um, there is sort of a hierarchy. That's the point of this. This is the, the retina, the LGN, and V1 are, are right there. Right? The rest of this is, is cortex. And they, these guys um, had a story about how each of these stages could be thought of as a successive stage in the processing hierarchy. And that's kind of true based on the connectivity of those areas, but it's actually pretty complicated. There's lots of parallelism. Like even in their story, all these guys are in parallel. There's also loads of feedback. There's at least as much um, as many axons going backwards down the visual system as there are axons going forward up the visual system. There are also lots of axons that skip stages and might go from here up to there without going by way of the guys in between. Okay? Um, so it's roughly a hierarchy, but it's a very complicated, mucky one. Okay? Okay. Um, boom. The first few stages, these guys down here, V1, V2, V3, V4, are sort of retinotopic. They sort of have maps of space. As you go up in that hierarchy, the maps get wonkier and wonkier. They get kind of distorted. They differentially, even more differentially, represent different parts of space. They might get a little ratty and mealy and harder to see. Um, but there's a bunch you can see. Here's an old picture showing you about eight retinotopic areas. This is the back of the head right there, V1. And there's a whole bunch of other retinotopic areas shown here, all mapped out with variations of that R theta mapping system that I described. Okay? So there are lots of retinotopic areas uh, that happen after V1. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens after that. Very loosely, and we'll talk more about this next time, we can think of this whole big mess as very loosely divided into two main processing streams. Those processing streams are not totally segregated. They actually overlap. You can see all the connections across. But very roughly, you can think of two processing streams in the human brain that go down like this into the temporal lobe and up like that into the um, parietal lobe. And you can see those in this wiring diagram. And we'll talk more about this next time. But very roughly, that dorsal processing stream is more involved in using visual information to act on objects. I forgot to bring a tennis ball and throw it into the crowd, which I love to do. But it's amazing we can do that, right? Something, a moving object is coming at you, boom, you catch it. Think about like designing a robot visual system that can do that. Like, best of luck to you, right? So just one second. So what you need to do that is you need to process the motion. You need to predict where it's going. You need to plan action according to the visual information. So think of this as visually guided action. Visually guided action is just amazingly skilled, right? Like, we, there are all kinds of this. Actually, you don't even need to have a tennis ball lobbed at you. Picking up a piece of paper is a very complicated thing. Robots suck at that kind of thing. That's really, really hard, right? OK, so that's visually guided action. And very loosely, the ventral pathway is the bit I've been mostly talking about, and that's figuring out what's in front of you. Recognizing faces, recognizing objects, reading words, 
um, recognizing places, all that stuff. Okay, so this is a very br loose division of all of these dozens of visual areas into these two main processing pathways. Okay, and we'll talk more about that. You see the same thing in monkeys. Okay, um, so um, what does all this mean? Okay, why do we have all these uh, different areas and what does it mean to be a visual area in the first place? Okay, um, the same guys who did that wiring diagram paper put forth an idea of this is what it means to be a visual area. This is what it is to say that this little part of cortex here is a thing that's different than that little part of cortex. Okay, so this is sort of a theory, it's an idea of what counts as a, a thing in the brain. We don't have to buy it, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot going for it. And the idea is that a region of cortex um, counts as, a, as an area, actually a cortical area, not just visual, if it's distinct from neighboring cortex in a bunch of ways. One, in function. Okay, so we already saw retinotopic maps. If you have a bunch of distinct retinotopic maps, that's a pretty good indication that each of those is a distinct cortical area. Okay, that's the most obvious way. But even if you don't have distinct um, retinotopic maps, you may have patches of cortex that respond differently than their neighbors. Like, for example, the fusiform face area responds selectively to faces and neighboring cortex does not. That's a functional difference from his neighbors, okay? Functional differences are, are one uh, property to, 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 to establish that a patch of cortex is really a distinct thing. Uh, another is specific connectivity. So that whole wiring diagram that I showed you, the, the connections of each of those little boxes, each of those cortical areas to all the other ones was different from each other, right? So they're highly interconnected, but that pattern of connectivity is different for each visual area, okay? Um, okay, and finally, this is a looser one and it doesn't always work, but for some areas in the visual system and some regions of cortex, there are actually differences in the cells and layer structure, and you can see that in histology. You take a postmortem brain, slice it up, look at the cortex in cross-section, and you see different structure there. Um, for example, the border between V1 and V2, you can totally see. In fact, you can see it even with MRI, even with anatomical MRI, and it's very, very sharp, and the reason that V1 and V2 look different is that V1 is getting this massive input coming up from the LGN. So there's a huge bundle of fibers that come in and connect straight in the middle layer of V1, causing a band there, a stripe in the cross section of the cortex that you see in V1 that's not there in V2, because you don't have that input going into V2, it just goes into V1. Okay, so that's an example of one way to define the edge of a cortical area by the, um, you know, what the structure of that cortex looks like, just the histology, the tissue, the stuff, okay? So those are the kind of accepted criteria for what, it, you know, what you have to have to have a, um, to call something a distinct cortical area. Um, these criteria are often violated. I named the fusiform face area the fusiform face area before I knew about this. I hadn't read that paper. I was only going on this. I didn't have that or that. I still kind of don't have that or that, although it's coming along a little bit, right? Okay. So people use area in different ways, but the official serious neuroscientist way is you've got to follow these, these criteria. Okay.